Hello everyone. Welcome to another advanced tutorial on private cellular networks, mainly focusing on private LT and 5G non-public networks. Now this is a long video, best to get some tea, coffee or popcorn before going further. So first of all, what is the need for private networks? While in this video, we will focus mainly on cellular networks, the same concept applies for non-cellular private networks like Wi-Fi, etc. So let's see the reasons. Improved coverage. Don't think just about people and their devices. Think about machines as well. Many factories and warehouses are Faraday cages with metal roof, walls, etc. Here, outside in coverage may be non-existent. Private networks help. High security. Private networks would be more secure due to the fact that people may not be aware of its existence and also unauthorized users would not be able to access the service. Privacy. Some enterprises may have confidential or sensitive data that they do not want uh, leaving their premises. Private networks can help keep this data local. Ultra low latency. If data is stored locally, then the storage and access times are far lower than if it was stored externally. Ultra high reliability. Now this is slightly controversial point as the reliability depends on how the equipment was manufactured. Now in addition, there are various factors like weather, backhaul etc. that can impact the reliability of the network. With a private network, uncertainties and disruptions due to these external factors are removed, thereby increasing reliability. Traffic prioritization. If a private network is serving multiple types of users, we will see later on which type, uh, traffic from certain user groups could be prioritized over others. Uh, congestion management. Congestion in a closed environment can be managed by proper planning of the network, depending on who the users are and where they are located, but also by local control if one group of users are being affected by other lower priority users. Interference management. This is related to spectrum. In case of licensed or dedicated spectrum, other users and equipment wouldn't cause interference. In case of unlicensed, mechanisms could be put in place to ensure there is no interference between the cells or from any external source. Cost control. Finally, in case of private networks that is deployed independently of an MNO, the running cost would, that would include subscription fee etc is significantly reduced, thereby bringing the cost down. The question you may have here is why has there been emphasis on private networks recently? So let's very quickly see some forecasts. This forecast is uh, from October last year by SNS Telecom and it says that the market is expected to reach $4.7 billion in annual spending by the end of 2020 and it's becoming the preferred approach to deliver wireless connectivity for critical communications, industrial IoT, enterprise and campus networks and public venues. The market will grow further at a compound annual growth rate of 19% between 2020 and 2023, eventually accounting for nearly $8 billion by the end of 2023. So this is a very high number and this is actually very tempting for many people to get into private networks. Similar sort of numbers uh, from uh, other analyst firms can be seen here. The most recent one is from Mobile Expert. Uh, in, it mentions that private LT and 5G used for oil and gas, mining, utilities, transportation, government including public safety and manufacturing industries will significantly increase due to the availability of new spectrum. The global private LT, 5G equipment and services market is expected to triple by 2025 to about $10 billion. Now, this is sort of similar to the one which we saw earlier, right? Because that said $8 billion by the end of 2023. And there are many other similar forecasts. I have listed them here, but I'm not going to actually go through all of them. You can download the slides from our SlideShare channel and click on the uh, link. So if you want to actually explore this particular topic further. 
So Nokia has been very vocal about their private network uh, portfolio. In an analyst event in November, they talked about their 120 plus private networks. This number may not sound large, but it's generating over 5% of their revenue. Uh, the slide lists uh, some of their private networks and of course you can as I said download the slides and click on the links if you want to go through the case study. So let's quickly look at why we may need private networks. Qualcomm has some fantastic examples that I'm going to use in the next few slides. Uh, so remember we are not just talking about people accessing the internet here. It's about people, machines, devices etc connected to the internal network uh, to process orders, report issues, security access, etc. So the first is an industrial example uh, like factories, power plants, warehouses, uh, refineries. The picture shows a factory where very often there is a lot of metal on the roof and walls. This makes them like Faraday cages as I mentioned earlier where there is no uh, outside in coverage. So nothing, no coverage from coming from outside to inside. Also putting a single access point may not be of much use due to metal walls uh, between the different sections. So many different players here need access to information like employees, automated guided vehicles, security cameras, machines, robots, operators etc. Then we have hubs like airports, rail yards, container ports etc. In this example of airport, you can see that the plane uh, that just arrives to its stand need to upload aircraft logs and engine data. The entertainment system may need updating. The ground staff and crew would need access for personal and work related reasons etc. This is uh, another example of hubs. So this is the container port. An example of oil platform. You have to remember that these oil platforms are quite away out in the sea. So here you need access not just for work but also for employees personal reasons as well as for entertainment. Buildings are getting more and more connected especially with IoT. You need to you need access for all kinds of work reasons including security, maintenance, collecting sensor, sensor data, entertainment etc. Right. So let's go to the basics and start looking at the typical mobile network architecture. This is how typically a mobile network looks like or used to look like and we have covered this uh, uh, very in, uh, in depth in our mobile network architecture tutorial. So if you want to go uh, further uh, in depth about this architecture just refer to that tutorial. So there were quite a few uh, well actually there are quite a few 2G and 3G private networks uh, which are still in operation. So I'm just going to start from 3G and sort of ignore 2G because 2G was mainly about voice and of course you have data access through GPRS as well but it used to be mainly about voice. So when we start from 3G, right, so the 3G private networks, they had to rely on operator core as core was comparatively complex. Uh, they had to rely on operator spectrum. Limited spectrum availability meant indoor networks relied on smaller cells. WCDMA was in a way uh, good for interference management, but the way uh, you know these private networks were made private was by restricting the users uh, by making cells closed. So we had the concept of closed subscriber group or CSG. Only users of that group could actually access the network. What it meant was uh, the other users not, of not the part of CSG would not be able to use the network uh, while in the CSG cell unless of course the operator had another spectrum uh, broadcasting 3G and this was very annoying to those users. So this was a really clunky approach not deployed too much uh, in practice unless used in something like offshore deployments like oil rigs etc. 
With 4G, the architecture got simplified. We didn't have the CS core or the circuit switch core anymore. Everything was IP packets. While in the real 4G networks, you had an issue of CS fallback uh, because not all these devices supported Volti, there was a much greater control in private networks. In fact, many 4G private networks had their own apps that handled voice as just voice over IP. So if we look at a simplified uh, LTE or 4G private networks, uh, simplified core was the main driver of initial LTE private networks. It was possible to host a private EPC or 4G core locally. And this actually gave rise to two different approach approaches for remote or offshore deployments with satellite for backhaul or connectivity. You could have a core locally and just connect to the internet via a satellite link. This is shown by the orange satellite on the top. The advantage of this approach is that even if the connectivity to outside world is not working for some reason, everything inside was still working without any issues. The other approach was not having a local core but relying on satellite for backhaul. This system would be simpler and cheaper but you would lose the advantage of keeping the data local and if the satellite link fails then the whole network goes down. Coming back to our list, one of the other advantages of a OFDMA air interface in LTE was that it allowed much better interference management with the macro networks. This was primarily due to intercell interference coordination or ICIC uh, between different base stations. So interference at the edge could be kept to a minimum. Also enhanced ICIC or EICIC allowed true hat nets or heterogeneous networks to become a possibility. This is a very simplistic uh, private LTE network in a box architecture. As you can see, uh, private LTE or PLT typically consists of E node B, EPC and content server. There can be many other optional components like uh, IMS that could be added if needed. Private LTE networks are used in many scenarios including factories, uh, public protection and disaster relief, enterprises, etc. Now you have most likely seen this or some similar timeline from 3GPP before. In 5G release 15, 3GPP defined private networks. Before going and looking at the, the release 15 private networks, let's have a very quick recap of 5G network architecture options. I'm assuming uh, here that you are familiar with this. If you're not, then you should check out our video on 5G terminology. This is how all the 4G networks are today. This is represented by option 1. Option 3 non-standalone 5G and this is how all commercial 5G networks are today. No exceptions. The official name of this is ENDC or EUTRA New Radio Dual Connectivity. If you look at specifications, uh, that's actually what you will find. This is how uh, the option 3 uh, or ENDC looks in practice. The 5G New Radio is only for access side. It's connected to the 5G uh, to the 4G core. So the release 15 5G uh, private network um, is designed for as a designed as standalone isolated solution for an enterprise or factory kind of situation. There was no interaction with any public network. Security could be based on 3GPP or non-3GPP mechanisms. Emergency calls could not be initiated on this network. There was no roaming etc. 
designed for a network in a box kind of solution very similar to 4G. So there was only limited interest because of little or no MNO involvement. And this is what release 15 is, right? Release 15 private network. And we are, that release 15 part is actually done here. So going back to a quick recap, the 4G network consisted of E node B, which is part of radio access network. It's also called long term evolution or LT or U-TRAN. Uh, so, uh, so, so LT long term evolution of U-TRAN. So it's designated as e -Utron. The 4G core is the evolved packet core or EPC and the whole system uh, 4G system was called the evolved packet system. The same concept translates to 5G. So we have the 5G new radio or G node B and here I am showing it as the NG RAN or next generation RAN. You will find out in a few minutes why. Uh, the core is called the 5G core and the whole system is called the 5G system or 5G S. So going back to our network architecture, the next option that will be coming later this year uh, after release 16 standards are finalized is option 2 or standalone new radio connected to 5G core. There are these other options 4, 5 and 7. Some operators are asking for this but there is no clear demand in the industry. The network infrastructure vendors and the chipset and handset manufacturers haven't been pushing for them either. So this is how the next generation RAN or NG RAN architecture looks like. In case of standalone option 2, there will be no next generation or NG E node Bs, only the 5G new radios or G node Bs, which would be connected to the 5G core. Another quick recap here of how the 5G system uh, service based architecture looks like we have a video on this topic so please have a look if you if you do not know how the service based architecture and the 5g core works so i'll be using this as an example when we go when we go slightly in depth so that's why i'm doing a quick recap here right so we looked at the 5g private networks as a part of uh, 3gpp release 15 uh, as I mentioned, there was little or no interest uh, in it. In release 16, the concept of uh, the concept was enhanced to non-public networks or NPN. If you look at the 3GPP specifications, uh, some of the specifications that contain private networks uh, was actually the private network part was replaced by non-public networks. So it's as simple as that. So let's try and understand what we mean by non-public networks. So the 3GPP technical specification 22.261 describes non-public networks as uh, non-public networks are intended for sole use of a private entity such as an enterprise and may be deployed in a variety of configurations utilizing both virtual and physical elements. Now, I should put a disclaimer here that, you know, when we talk about uh, going further on, I will keep on saying enterprise, but enterprise means a lot of things, right? So enterprise would be the generic term, and then we will see the different kind of, uh, you know, the private network. So whether it's a, it's a venue, whether it's an in-building, whether it's a factory, etc. So coming back to NPN, they may be deployed as completely standalone networks or they may be hosted by a PLMN or they may be offered as a slice of a PLMN. So three main high level approaches. In any of these deployment options, it is expected that unauthorized UEs, those that are not associated with the enterprise will not attempt to access the NPN, which could result in resources being used to reject the UE and thereby not being available for the UEs of the enterprise. Okay, very important point. UEs of the enterprise will not attempt to access a network that they are not authorized to access. 
For example, some enterprise UEs may be restricted to allow access uh, to only access the non-public network of the enterprise, even if the PLMN coverage is available in the same geographic area. Other enterprise UEs may be able to access both the non-public network and the PLMN where specifically allowed. So, you know, uh, depending on how they are configured, they can access only either only the NPN or NPN as well as PLMN. Or in some cases, they will be able to access even multiple uh, non-public uh, non networks. So this is a picture from technical report 23.734. As you can see, here we have a non-public network with uh, some ID. Uh, UEA has authorized service provided by service provider 1. And UEB is being provided authorized service by service provider number N. The non-public network is shared by multiple service providers here. Right, so let's look at the different types of uh, NPNs. The first is the standalone NPN or SNPN. Okay, just remember the term because we will be coming uh, uh, using this term often. So SNPN is operated by an NPN operator and it's independent of the service provider or MNO and does uh, not rely on network functionality provided by them. So UE can have subscription to one or more uh, non-public network. List of NPN IDs is available in SIM, uh, in the SIP, sorry. Uh, access to public network is possible as NPN can be considered as an untrusted network. Now we have a tutorial on how 5G architecture enables fixed mobile convergence. So check that out to understand what I mean actually, uh, you know, uh, here. So at the, in this particular point. And finally, access to NPN via public network is also possible. The second type of NPN is the public network integrated NPN or PNI NPN. So PNI NPN is an NPN deployed with the support of service provider or a mobile network operator. Different approaches are possible including dedicated spectrum, slicing, etc. Closed access group or CAG concept is used to protect from other UEs uh, uh, from accessing the NPN and wasting resources. So what we mean here is that if a UE is unauthorized, it shouldn't even start the RATS procedure because that is wasting critical resources of a private network. UE subscription contains CAG IDs, uh, so it would be in the SIM card and CAG ID is broadcast in the SIP. There is this 5G LAN type service, which is very interesting. I'm not going to read all of it here, but let me try and explain it in a simple terms. So we have a local area networks or LANs in our offices, homes, etc. With a 5G network, you can support the same concept over a very wide area. So you can have multiple devices, maybe in different parts of the country, but they could be behaving like they exist in a 5G LAN. Uh, this could be on any kind of spectrum, uh, right? And via any access. So public network, outdoors, indoors, via small cells, uh, via fixed access, via relays, etc. And this is very interesting. And I look forward to seeing this in practice in the next uh, few years. Then you have the concept of 5G LAN virtual network. This concept extends the 5G LAN type services by creating a virtual network for private communications. The thing that caught my attention was that a virtual network may span multiple countries, but the member UEs will still need to be have a subscription to the a PLMN in their home country, right? So you have a virtual network in a home country and one of the UEs actually travels to another country and it could still be part of the 5G LAN virtual network. The 5G system shall support on demand establishment of UE to UE multicast and broadcast private communications between member UEs of the same 5G LAN virtual network. Then of course there are procedures in place 
to restrict communications based on location there will be need to uh, there will need to be some guarantee regarding latency and consistent qoe routing based on private address uh, addressing schemes will be supported etc so let's do a very quick comparison between SNPN and PNI NPN. You will see in the end why we looked at the 5G LAN type services and the 5G LAN virtual network. So as far as Spectrum is concerned, as NPN can uh, use own, unlicensed or shared. In case of PNI NPN, again, it could be operator Spectrum, unlicensed, shared. If you look at investment, SNPN would generally require high capex because the enterprise will have to pay for the equipment upfront. But there should be low OPEX because if you have the equipment and everything, there is no subscription fees, license fees, etc. In case of PNI and PN, it would be the other way around. As the service provider would deploy everything, so no upfront cost, the OPEX will be high because service provider may charge maintenance in addition to subscription charges. As uh, So you know, this can actually go uh, be quite high. The network maintenance and devices, SIM subscription, etc. should be straightforward as we have discussed. Security is an interesting one. In the end, it is enterprise responsibility, regardless of the type of NPN. In case of PNI NPN, service provider would have the experience, expertise, and their own security architecture in place, guaranteeing better security. In case of standalone NPN, there would generally be no roaming, right? In case of PNI and PN, standard roaming facility would be available uh, in case if enterprises want to actually use it. In case of SNPN, limited advanced services like 5G LAN, 5G LAN virtual network, as we discussed, would be available. But in case of PNI and PN, full range of advanced services would be available depending on whatever the service provider supports. So we have discussed the basics of non-public networks as is being planned for release 16. Remember that this was uh, just at a very high level, right? So uh, if you look at specifications, they're probably thousand times more uh, in, in, in depth. So what I want to do here is to discuss the deployment architectures of non-public network. So for that, I will actually use this service-based architecture picture we looked at earlier and simplify it to show the following blocks. So we are going to just see the G node B, the 5G control control plane, UDM, uh, right? The unified data uh, management, the user plane function, UPF and services. And I can actually simplify them further to show as uh, radio, signaling, database, user data and services, okay? So just simplifying it, so it helps us understand the concepts. I'm now going to actually look at different scenarios that has been defined as part of 5G ACIA white paper. Uh, and that white paper was called 5G non-public network for networks for industrial scenarios. And I'm going to simplify them to explain and make you understand it. So scenario one is an isolated private 5G network. Uh, where the private network is actually deployed independently of the public network. So this is uh, the standalone NPN case, okay? I can show this scenario simply as shown here, where I'm using the same colors for both the public and the private networks. The shade is slightly darker for public network and lighter for private network. Here we can see that everything in standalone NPN is independent of the public network, right? The MEC uh, or the multi-access edge computing is actually is the data center that stores all the user data from the enterprise. As we discussed before, there is no need for a connection from a private network to the outside world, but it may be needed. So I have shown it as optional, right? So which is basically dotted. So let's look at the pros of this kind of deployment. So there is a complete isolation from public networks. QoS or QoE uh, experience or service is independent of the public network. Even if the public network fails, it doesn't impact the private network. 
data is stored locally and securely ultra low latency is possible due to proximity of all components reduced wiring within the factory uh, or enterprise etc and no monthly subscription charges for the end users now let's look at the cons high capex for the software hardware license fees etc spectrum cost may be high uh, well unlicensed spectrum would be prone to interference right the good news is that in some countries uh, are now keeping a small chunk of spectrum for private networks that could be used and would not have these interference issues the main challenge is that it is extremely difficult to find it staff that would know how to deploy and maintain a private network enterprises would need to help from system integrators and that will actually add to capex and opex so this is the same as the earlier standalone npn or isolated private 5g network but this is actually built by the service provider okay so service provider is building th this isolated network for the enterprise as you will probably notice the shading on the radio part is now the same for both the private and the public network to emphasize that this is actually service providers spectrum so rather than going through all the pros and cons i will only discuss the differences which are also actually highlighted in yellow so in the pros the license as uh, service provider spectrum is cheaper from capex point of view uh, and less prone to interference than uh, unlicensed or shared license also service provider maintains the running of the network with service level agreements in place so no need for enterprise to worry about skilled it staff etc in cons the enterprise now has to pay a monthly subscription charges for the end users or depending on the service provider it could be based on the access nodes or based on site size or the amount of data transferred etc so let's look at the second scenario from the 5g acia white paper ran sharing between public private 5g network the simplest way to understand this is that the service provider deploys the ran equipment in the premises for in building this could be something like a small cells for something like a port this could be micro cells or even macro cells right there is a guaranteed coverage uh, in an area where there was no coverage before or poorage coverage so poor coverage so this is what uh, you know the ran sharing actually helps so as you can see here or maybe not i am showing the ran sharing by using a, a shading in the radio part okay so for the private network so even though i am calling it a, a private network sometimes uh, in this example they are just non public networks okay so the only thing really shared in in the non public or the private network is the radio part everything else is still separate so when we talk about ran sharing i just wanted to point out that there are different types of ran sharing options available as can be seen here we have a nice tutorial explaining these different ran sharing options so do check them out you know if you really want to learn more this is actually also a good time to introduce uh, campus networks deutsche telekom has been actively promoting them for a while and their website defines campus networks as exclusive mobile networks for a defined local campus a university or individual buildings such as an office building they are tailored to individual needs of users and meet future requirements in the area of industry 4.0 as i have highlighted without the 5g core uh, that uh, will enable network slicing natively the campus networks today uh, are more like ran sharing there are also different types of campus networks or when i say enterprise networks right so th those are the generic terms but in practice they apply to industrial networks office networks network in venues like stadia 
and non-stationary type of networks. So each of them has different quality requirements, uh, purposes, coverage requirements and needs different types of devices. So I won't go any further in depth here. Uh, I will let you have a look at this offline. This is actually from a, a paper by Arthur D. Little and the, the link is actually provided in the reference. So when you download the slides, if you want to go into detail uh, on campus networks and the different types of campus networks, you can actually look at that paper. So coming back to RAN sharing between the public private network compared to the previous uh, case, the pros would be uh, the QAS QE is still fairly independent of the public network even if that fails but in the cons the complete isolation from the public network is gone. So looking at the third case there is a, a shared RAN and control plane between the public and the non-public network. So this can be shown here as you will notice the private network relies on signaling and database from the public network now. So for this case in the pros the capex is significantly lower than the previous cases. In the cons the signaling is now dependent on the public network. So uh, if that's overloaded the QOE can suffer. Also all subscriber information is now stored in the public network database which could be an issue. It should be noted that the user data is still uh, stored locally as uh, is shown by the MEC block. The final case is that uh, the non-public network is deployed as a slice in the public network. So here except for the radio path everything in a, is a slice uh, in the public network. There is no need for any of the uh, 5G system to be present uh, in the uh, premises of the NPN right or in the NPN. Also the user data is now stored either in the service provider data center as shown or it could be in the public cloud like you know one of those uh, AWS kind of uh, uh, options. So the pros for this approach is that due to slicing there is a logical separation with uh, public networks. Also capex is just uh, is very low or just nothing. But there are a lot of cons in this case. For example, no physical separation with public network, dependency on service provider network for signaling as well as for QoS, QoE, latency is much higher uh, and the main one would be data stored in a service provider data center. There is another way to classify private networks, standalone, hybrid and virtual private networks. I have put the cases we discussed in different columns uh, to show the mapping, right? The rows discuss who is responsible for a particular aspect. So for example, in case of SIMS, in case of standalone and uh, shared RAN case, the customer or the enterprise would be responsible, right? Uh, when it comes to the RAN and signaling sharing uh, or uh, the sliced approach, the service provider would be responsible for SIMS. Similarly for uh, other columns. So I don't plan to go through all of this here, you know, because otherwise this will become too long. So finally, we have further enhancements of NPN planned for release 17. Now just to clarify, release 17 specifications work has just started. So we won't see a conclusion of these new features until the next year at the earliest. So here is a list of enhancements then we can discuss very quickly. The SNPN and service provider separation will study enhancements to enable support for the standalone NPN along with subscription credentials owned by an entity separate from the SNPN. So this will enable third parties to provide services on someone else's NPN keeping complete logical separation. Onboarding will study how to support UE's onboarding and provisioning 
for the non-public networks. For example, there should be a standard mechanism that can apply out of the box. No need for any special procedures or hacks. VIAPA, which stands for Video Imaging and Audio for Professional Applications. Uh, so the study enhancements to the 5G system for NPN to support NPN related service requirements for production of audio visual content and services uh, example for service continuity and enabling reception of services uh, data services from two networks finally study support for IMS and emergency services for SNPN so these are all the things which are planned for release 17 some of, some more things might be added or some of the existing things might be removed so it's too early to say so we, we won't really know this for a while. So here is a list of references if you want to actually study any of the topics we covered uh, in detail. Right. So this uh, you can download these slides from our slide share channel. So I know this was a bit long, but hopefully you like my approach and understood the difference between private networks and non-public networks, their architectures, their pros and cons, the enhancements, new features in pipeline, their responsibilities, etc. So as always, please share your thoughts and feedback in the comments below and goodbye until the next time.